And so I, I put into my art, I had done botanical illustration before, realistic illustration, but I had also done some cartooning, and so I kind of put them together in all these mushroom drawings. And, you know, clearly over here on the, on your left, I um, animate the mushrooms in the way that we've all seen, if you've looked at the little ones and the big ones. I mean, they do, you know, Fantasia, far ahead of us, had done the same thing, right? And, but here, even in the uh, microscopic parts of the life cycle, you don't know, it just, it just lends, mushrooms lend themselves in all cultures, I think, to animism. And then just playing with these concepts and with the interpenetration of realities and all of that kind of stuff. So these are all illustrations in the book. And then at the end of the book, by the time we published it, Terrence and I, we'd fallen in love by then and we decided we were going to go for the long haul. And, um, and we started a business, a mail order business, selling spores. And this business under Lux Natura, a company we started, lasted a few years um, until a, because uh, spores have no psilocybin in them. So you could grow the mushroom from them, but the spores themselves could not be made illegal. Psilocybin was illegal but you could, the spores were not. So we sold them legally as a mail order business and advertised, and we were the first spore print company that um, we knew of, at least. And, um, and then some Republican state senator in Orange County got into trouble. I think he was caught in the men's bathroom with somebody, and uh, he, his reputation was in peril, and so to redeem himself in the eyes of conservatives, he had to make something illegal. And how on earth he found out about us, I don't know, but he managed to get it through the state uh, legislature that psilocybin spores were illegal from now on, even though they had no psilocybin in them. Wow. That is a very targeted, we're the only company selling them, we're <laughs> tiny, we're two people. So <laughs> that was weird, but uh, we stopped doing that then and moved into another mode. Um, what year was that? That was, I think, uh, let's see, that must have been about 1979. So. Did you fear police action at the time? Pardon? You said you stopped immediately, but were you afraid they were going to essentially pick you up? Not for that. <laughs> <laughs> It was too subtle. <laughs> and some of the other books that came out, including Field Guides. And um, I was talking with Peter Werner. He's not here, I think, because he's giving a talk. He's next door. Right. He's in the next room. Yes, he's giving a talk next door. So we had we talked at dinner last night. And he was asking if we realized at that time how many other philosophy species there were in the West. But we didn't. This was before we had only barely heard of cyanescence up in the far northwest. Azurescence hadn't been described yet. Paul Stamets hadn't talked about that. We knew Paul. We knew him early on. Um, and Jeff Chilton and uh, Jonathan Ott and Jeremy Bigwood and um, you know a bunch of these different people who were going to publish and did publish later. And um, but uh, but Peter was telling me that there are four other species of psilocybin mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, now identified in the West that are that have very restricted areas, and um, and are all. I think he said they're all um, kind of uh, descendants of or, or derivatives of uh, the Stunciae family. Stunciae. Um, but we didn't know about that then, and they might not have proven, you know, kitchen worthy. I mean, easy to grow, like like Cubensis did. I said yesterday uh, that Cubensis is seen by the Mazatec people as not necessarily their favorite mushroom, because every mushroom has a different action, has a different ratio of psilocin and psilocybin. Some of them have biocysteine. The ratio of these different compounds in them, this is the scientific view, changes the effect on our brain, on our nervous system, and changes our experience. In their view, they're each actually, actually different beings. They're different, they have different personalities, just as you and I have different personalities. We're human, but we're unique. They say the same about these species that hold philosophy. If they want to do a, a hard job, if they want to really get something done, roll up your sleeves, figure something out, launch a new life endeavor, um, start a, you know, selling tortillas on the side of the road, that would be starting a business. The, 
whatever it is, then you might go to um, Cubensis to ask, which they would call San Isidro, the, the patron saint of labor, um, to uh, ask for guidance, to ask for protection, so you can do this thing, so you can have the fortitude to cut a new road, or to build a new house, or whatever the piece of work is. So um, Cubensis lent itself to our culture as the only one that really volunteered to grow vigorously when we had what we saw as a lot of work to do, a hell of a lot of work to do. We had this culture. We had, you know, we were in Vietnam still. We had Nixon and Watergate. We had terrible messes that it's good to remember in a day like this, that we have been in terrible messes before and we kind of got one foot at least out of them before we got back in them. So let's hope that that happens. But um, um, I'm jumping ahead here. I'll just let you look at that for a minute. So, um, ah, <laughs> it's funny, but yes, it goes so fast. Uh, yes. I mean, you may cover this later, but they were using cubensis in Mexico, but I understood that came from Cuba by way of Africa. Is that, is, how, do you know at what point? Or I don't think anybody knows that. It's global. Cubensis is the only one of the psilocybes that is global in the tropics. Yes. And, I mean, I've never heard of it specifically in Africa, but there's probably somebody who knows. I always, I don't know where I heard, but I was heard about that time that it was coming from Delta Crew in Africa. So I don't. Yeah, I don't know about that. It's it's established in 1976 in the Amazon, working with an ayahuasquero. He um, and he was a very, very credible, wise fellow. Um, this is way before ayahuasca tourism, so it was, it was just us. And um, and he, uh, Don Fidel Mosambique, uh, he knew the mushrooms. He the, the way that a traditional ayahuasquero would analyze a plant um, that they didn't know would be to brew up a pot of ayahuasca and drop a leaf or two of that other plant, or their bark or their root, into the ayahuasca, and then take the ayahuasca. And whatever was different about ayahuasca would be like looking through a microscope at that mm. plant. It's a way that he would study something new. And he had done that with the mushroom. He had dropped cubensis, which grew out in the, uh, you know, in the pastures. Um, he would drop that into ayahuasca. Um, and it, it moved into the festival scene, such as it was. And festival scene is even stronger now than it was then. But I remember one time in, uh, I guess it was all the way up into the mid-90s. Uh, but... Uh, Someone who was in a position to know told me that eight pounds of cubensis had gone into the reggae festival, the three-day reggae festival up in uh, Humboldt County, and I computed that at 450 grams per pound, that was 3,600 uh, grams, and if everybody took two grams at <laughs> the three-day festival, how many people were on mushrooms at a reggae festival? <laughs> and that was just one. And that was happening everywhere, you know? So, wow, I thought, well, that is really, it's shifting things, you know? It's shifting things. For one thing, it's making us love mushrooms. Yeah. I mean, how we, we can't tell. I'm not giving it total credit, but we can't tell how much this fantastic interest in the fungi, which has influenced our cuisine, which has influenced our love of nature, our love of being outdoors. All of you guys are obsessed, you know, all of this stuff. <laughs> we don't know how much this little kind of vitamin pill of consciousness, you know, affected us, but it, it had some effect. It did. So since I only have a few minutes, and uh, I'll just say that this edition of the book, um, well, Andor Press sold 100,000 copies, and snorted up all their product and uh, went out of business. And the book went out of print. And so um, I bought it and we published it in 1986 and I added some more illustrations to it and um, sold it for a while, uh, Selux Natura and then Quick Trading uh, bought it and uh, they still sell it and now over 300,000 copies just of this one. And there are, of course, a number of other little handbooks on how to grow psilocybin mushrooms. This is now an antique, but people are still buying it. You know, there are there are cleaner methods, there are um, better photographs, <laughs> but uh, the facsimile almost is still being sold. And I added by 86, I added illustrations reflecting that I had had more mushroom experiences oh. in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs>
And I just wanted to say there were some distinctive things about this book and about this period and the way of thinking, and that part of it was this sense of the long story. And there was a timeline in there. Fictionalized, you know, I mean, as you know, if you knew who Terence was, he was a raconteur and he made stuff up, too. But um, So it went way back in history. But this is just one little excerpt at the end analyzing the effect of the mushroom that this that these, uh, I'm going to move right around here, so it's so okay. Invasion of North America by hallucinogenic mushrooms continues, leading shortly to metamorphosis of human beings into a symbol symbiotic species. That was 1976. <laughs> by 1981, so many copies sold, numerous imitations, love and dedication to make psilocybin the hallucinogen of choice in high-tech society. 1981 high-tech society. <laughs> and then on into... Uh, you know, talk about Soma and all of this uh, still unsolved mystery of what are these powerful agents of transformation in human history mm -hmm. and a lot of speculation that goes with that. Um, so our mission, I think I skipped that. Did I skip the, the slide that said question and answer? What is our mission? I think I did. Mm -hmm. Because our mission was really back when Terrence and I first decided to work together as a team was, was really, how can we change um, human consciousness yeah. with the tools we have in the most po positive and effective way without putting dogma in it, just giving the tool, the tool for consciousness change. And you know, people who had produced LSD um, and, and uh, had had a similar mission. It's a, it's a noble mission, it's just not a controllable mission. <laughs> um, just a sec. And so we, the answer was, for us, it was, oh, grow the mushroom, make the spores, spread the information, make it available to people, let the people make what they want of it, you know, and this concept of diaspora. Diaspora means spores, spora, across time, across space. That's what a diaspora is. It's a movement outward and across time and space. And, um, and so we thought, okay, we generate, we help this little organism that has been relatively unknown and underutilized, except for in a very small part of the world, we help it spread with encouragement and information and humor and beauty around the world, and that will be a good piece of work, you know, if we can do that. And of course, it's got its shadows, it's got its power stuff, it's got its relationships that bloom and fall apart, it's got all of those things in it. It's life, we're funky, we're humans, you know. But, um, but I am happy that it has worked as well as it has, there we go, and, uh, and, and reached so far and affected so many other things. And I wish sometimes, because I like to look at the big picture in history, I wish sometimes that we could just have, I probably have to take just the right dose of mushrooms to figure this out, but that we could just have like a map where the connections, what caused this, what are the glowing threads of relationship, what's the mycelium, of these occurrences and these upwellings of curiosity and knowledge and community and all of this stuff that's come from, um, you know, the spread of this one little organism. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there, and if we've got a couple of minutes, I'll take questions. So I have. There's been some articles recently about the advantage of low dose psilocybin for people with end of life problems and how. It helps. I mean, what it, you know, yeah. it helps them. Helps them go through transition. Yeah, yeah let go. Transition. transition. Yes. Good work. So, any, I don't know if you can enlighten us any on that, but another thing is um, watch that movie Avatar again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that too, like how much of the arts yeah. have been affected? Yeah. You know, I mean, we could say that about cannabis, we could say it about Amazing movie. everything. Yes. Yes. I just a clarification. So, are there any philosophy species native to this area, or were they all introduced? Well, as far as we knew then, there were none native here. And um, I, in talking to Peter, who seems to know um, a lot about it, he's like teaching microscopy here. In case you want to talk to him personally. Um, he said that he doesn't think there are any that just arose here, but because of the um, the nature of the, the lignicolous mushrooms, the wood-loving ones. Now, Cubensis is a cellulose-loving mushroom, but um, some of the psilocybes are wood-loving and 
So cyanescence up in the northwest gets established in wood chips, and wood chips gets mo get moved around, and mm -hmm. it propagates in mild climates, and then it moves on. And now, and azurescence probably has gotten established in the Bay Area in that way. We know cyanescence has. We think azurescence has. And then there's one other of these that I have not heard of, Alenii, I think it's called, Philosophy Alenii, that he thinks is getting established in this region, too. But they're not native. They're not native to here. But this is part of, you know, human migration, climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you still have any kind of uh, belief or proof that they may have come from space? <laughs> what? Belief or proof are such different things. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a question. That's all. I think we don't know. Thank you very much, everybody.